idea because it goes switch. That's another thing. That clock in the back of the room belongs to me because this school was too stupid to put a clock in the back of the room where I could see it. It's only on bottle cheapy. But I need to get an atomic clock because that thing's that thing's running slow. To have Shark Tank's a clock like that and it sets itself every night at midnight, it checks some satellite. It's cheap. It's not expensive now. And so it's always right. It's just kind of nice. This one certainly isn't. Morning, Hill Center. That's good enough. You don't have to mess with the mic. <laughs> Waving is fine. I speak sign, I think. I'm going to have to learn sign. I may start giving my lectures in sign. Go figure. of the fact that we were shut off about five minutes early <coughs> and we've been shut off about five minutes early a couple of times and because of the time that I had to fight with the machine to get started we're a little bit behind the other classes uh, so as soon as that hour hand points straight up this is going to be kind of like a rodeo ride I don't know if any of you know what that's like but you get inside there and you your partner pulls your hat down over your head and slaps your face to wake you up, tightens that bull rope up, and then you say, outside, and just get ready. Here we go, outside. I don't know if they still say that or not. That's what they said when I was stupid enough to ride on bulls. That was a different life, I guess. I had a partner, and he would always chew me out, scream and yell at me, slap my face. Give one last tug, we get that bull rope on right and dig spurs in and then you kind of didn't want to say it, you nod your head or say outside and they'd pull that thing and that bull would go exploding out of that chute. And in my case, you usually left me in the dust pretty quickly after that, but <laughs> I was not the world champion, a champion bull rider at all. My, my dad was uh, bulls back in the day. I did bulls. I did uh, bareback broncs. I think bareback broncs are the easiest. And then I did saddle broncs, and they're the scariest. They're scarier than bulls, actually, because you can get hung up in the saddle sometimes, which makes it kind of dangerous. You don't want to be riding with one foot in the stirrup and the rest of you dragging out behind the horse. It does terrible things to your facial makeup. Okay, let me get this thing up so we can get going right at the beginning. We're still working on that same set of slides, but we're about done with it, that same PowerPoint. The one that says external influences. Gee, Mr. Hunt doesn't have anything nasty or mean to complain about this morning, so we're going to start straight into our notes, straight into this. We were talking about, and I think we kind of finished off what we call either King George's War or the War of Austrian Succession <clears throat> when we left off last time. The whole point about learning about these wars, King William's War, Queen Anne's War, King George's War, otherwise known as the War of the League of Augsburg, uh, the War of Spanish Succession, the War of Austrian Succession, is to look at the effects they had on the colonies. 
And the basic effect that all of them had, one thing they all had in similar, was that they caused, in part, people to ignore the colonies. But as these wars progress, you see another characteristic. It's always the English against the French. The English and whoever they're friends with that week, and the French and whoever their friends are that week. A lot of times it's the French and the Spanish on one side, not always. Uh, and the third thing you see is, as it goes along, colonists are increasingly apprehensive about things Indians are doing, and you start seeing the growth of the identity of something called Americans, which no one really thought of before. Everyone was an Englishman in the, in the colonies. Even the people that moved to the colonies from other countries, really, because they were under the control of the English crown. But as you go through King George's War, when the uh, British draft a whole bunch of colonists to fight down South America and take, take them down on their fleet under Admiral Vernon, uh, Old Grog, they called him, you start seeing a resentment from the Americans for being picked up to go do, do the fighting. And it wasn't just laziness. It wasn't like being a draft dodger or I'm afraid to go to war uh, like we see in more modern times sometimes. But it was, I'm having to leave my family and the Indians might get them. You're dragging away from my home, which I should be defending. Uh, and that's kind of a scary thing. On the one hand, you're over fighting a war in a place you don't know, and on the other hand, you're worried about what's going on at home and who's taking care of your home. And I suppose there were a certain number of them that made it back home and found out there was nothing left there. On the English side, they're irritated with the colonists because they think that the colonists should be taking care of their own dirty linen and the English shouldn't have to come over and help them with it. And they don't want to send their sons over to the Americas to fight what they think the colonists should be taking care of. So both sides have a kind of a legitimate agreement, and both sides start identifying themselves as a little different from the other side. Even though they're all Englishmen, they start, the Englishmen start thinking about these colonials and looking down their nose at them, and uh, they start calling these Americans after a while, and oh my goodness, what an insult. And uh, the Americans start thinking that they're not the same thing as the mainline Englishmen. Still, there's no real thoughts of independence or anything like that. That takes us all the way through King, King George's War. I'm going to go flying through these slides, and I won't make you look at them until I get where I'm going except that I can't even see it on this stupid thing. Hello? There's a problem old people have. They wear bifocals, and the bifocals are for reading a book, and the screen is further away than the distance of the book. So I either try and squint and see it, or I have to change glasses. And I don't like changing glasses, so. Let's see where we are here. See if I can find it. There we go. Okay. On the current slide, if you don't care at all about that slide, it's one of the battles in that in King George's War. But just to point out that most of the British Army is over where that arrow is pointing at. That's why they had to borrow the Americans. Oh, it didn't come up on the machine. Thank you. I pushed the button, it just didn't come up. Well, I've got to push the button again, and again. Hallelujah. Okay, that's the Battle of Dettingen. You don't need to remember the battle. I'm just pointing out that's where the British Army is located, and that's why they were going down and drafting colonists to fight when they went after Portobello and Cartagena. That's on the lower right-hand side is a picture of the King of England, the last time in history that a king led his own forces in the field of battle. That was George II, so you could say bad things about him, whatever you wanted to, but one of them wasn't he was going to sit at home and tell other people to go out and do his fighting for him. So you've got to give him a little bit of honor for that. Uh, 
when this is all over, what we find is the world's changed in Europe because now the English are fighting on the side of a new group of people called the Prussians under Frederick the Great and his successors. And the French and the Austrians have kissed and made up. So when they get into their next dispute, the sides have changed, all the teams have changed, but the principal actors, the English and the French, are still opponents of each other. And we'll talk about the Seven Years' War, and we're going to go through it pretty quickly so that we can keep up with things. It's a global war. You can almost call it a world war. It involves every European great power, spans five continents, Europe, the Americas, West Africa, India, the Philippines even. It split Europe into two groups, Great Britain, Prussia, Portugal, and some small German-speaking states. And the other side is France and Austria, the Holy Roman Empire, the Russian Empire until 1762, and then they quit. Spain, Sweden, Saxony. There's also fighting in India, where the French and the British were trying to steal each other's colonies. So the only big difference in this and some of the other earlier wars we talked about, one of them, the main one to me, is that it started a year early in America. And it all had to do with that place, the Ohio River Basin. A river basin is the area in which all the water that runs down streams eventually trickles into the main river, into the Ohio. And let's look at a quick chronology in 1649, the king of France claimed the Ohio River Valley. He'd never been there, but he claimed it anyway. And he sent some of his people down. If you look at this map, see if I can get an arrow that you can see. See that arrow? Yeah, it's faint, isn't it? They started a chain of forts all the way down this line to assert their ownership of that territory. Strangely enough, at the same time, the King of England claimed the same territory. Now, in the, in the case of the English, they're going to be a little bit slow to it, but Governor Dinwiddie of Virginia is going to send a young surveyor by the name of George Washington and some militiamen out there to check and see if there's any Frenchmen out there and to disabuse the Frenchmen of, of the fact that that's their territory. Unfortunately for George Washington and friends, the Frenchmen are already there and they built a little fort in the forks of the Allegheny, the Monongahela, which they will call Fort Duquesne. And there'll be three or four hundred people on that fort, which way vastly outnumbers what George Washington had in his group. George Washington had some Indians, uh, a force of 20 or 30 militiamen so he was not going to take on the French. But as he's pulling back across this, if you can look at this map, I'll show you another map. As he's pulling back across the Monongahill River, headed back in the direction of Pennsylvania and Maryland, and eventually Virginia, uh, he's going to spot a small French patrol, or his scouts will spot it. They're going to ambush that patrol. They're going to capture some of them, kill some of them, Remember, they had the Indians with them, too, even if the colonists weren't inclined to kill somebody, uh, their friends were, uh, including a young French lieutenant. And unfortunately for young Mr. Washington, uh, the Indians had a custom back then, uh, and that custom was if you had a, a brave enemy, you somehow or other drew from his strength by either torturing him before he died or cutting out his heart and maybe eating some of it. And that happened to the young French lieutenant. And somehow or other survivors got back to the main force of the French and let them know what happened. And they came after George Washington with a vengeance. And he's withdrawn all the way down into the little fort he set up called Fort Necessity. It wasn't much. He told his troops they had to dig in, but it was rainy and they didn't feel like digging, digging trenches and being in the mud and all that. So they didn't do a very good job of preparing, and they're surrounded by a very large French force. And it becomes obvious they're going to have to surrender. The French officer, in order to avoid any more bloodshed, 
offers them a deal. He says, you can take your guns and your men and leave and never come back if you quit fighting now. And George Washington agrees to this. They say, oh, wait a minute, before you leave, you also have to sign this document of surrender, which was written in French, and unfortunately, Mr. Washington couldn't read French, but he signed it, and what, what the heck, let's get out of here, signed it, and it turns out it was an admission of committing a war crime. He took responsibility for killing that lieutenant. Uh, that's going to plague him later on, because the French are going to make a big deal out of that, but he's going to end up going back to Governor Dinwiddie and saying, you got whooped. That's going to be followed up by the British. There's other map, Three Rivers. That's roughly where George Washington was. Uh, the borders of Maryland and Pennsylvania and all that are a little bit iffy. I think he crossed them all. Uh, he's going to get in a battle with the French up near a place called Great Meadow. And then he's going to go home, back to Alexandria. In, in 1754, the senior British officer in North America was a fellow by the name of Braddock. And General Braddock is going to be unhappy about the, the results of George Washington's trip. And he's going to bring regular British soldiers and more militiamen and George Washington, because he knows the way, and they're going to go and show the French who's who. So he thinks. He doesn't listen to a lot of advice. He just says, just show me the way and keep your mouth shut. And they get ambushed by a large force of French and Indians, and about half of their complement of men are killed, mainly British soldiers, mainly not American militiamen because they know how to hide and, and run. Uh, and George Washington finds himself in charge of the group, and he very skillfully disengages with the French, from the French and the Indians and manages to get a certain number of his people back to Virginia again. Second great setback. Now, over in Europe, things are going wrong. So the British Crown's not inclined to even pay attention to this. That was Braddock's problem. Braddock's dead, so it's not his problem anymore. Uh, back to the drawing board. It's going to take them until about 1758 before they're able to get enough soldiers ready to send over to follow up on this and try and regain their losses. There's an etching of George Washington and Fort Necessity and who knows if that's what it looked like. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't have uh, iPhones or anything, so we're not going to know what any of them looked like. There's General Edward Braddock. May he rest in peace. He was buried out there in the field. They buried him, in fact, in, in the middle of the road and then trampled over it, not out of disrespect for him, but they figured it would hide his grave so that it couldn't be dug up. While this was going on, the people in the colony suddenly realized the French and the Indians are giving us a bloody nose, and it doesn't seem like the English can protect us. And so a number of the colonies, Connecticut, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New York, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, all get together. Virginia figures they've done their share already. These guys are going to get together up in Albany, New York. They call it the Albany Congress or the Albany Convention of 1754. Now this is important to remember. remember that's, one of the, that's their symbol that they join or die. Uh, in theory, I guess that's a picture of a rattlesnake all cut up in pieces. Uh, Braddock had already suggested before he took off on his trip that they do this because he was relying on local militia a lot as well as he didn't have that many British soldiers. So now he's dead. They have the convention. One of the leading lights of the convention is our friend Benjamin Franklin, arguably the most brilliant mind in the colonies. He just recognizes that by the English. Spent a lot of time in England arguing our side of things later on. This convention proposes that these colonies unite, not seeking independence, but unite to defend themselves against the French and the Indians and do it in a more organized fashion. 
and they put a lot of work into this, figuring out who will run this outfit and what everybody's role is and how they'll raise money for it and that sort of thing. They call it the Albany Plan of Union. I want you to remember that. Ben Franklin, Albany Plan of Union, Albany Congress or Convention. Uh, they send copies of it out to all the colonies for them to okay it. And they send a copy over to the Crown for the Crown to okay it. Can anybody tell me, can anybody guess who turned it down? Who said no, thumbs down? Okay, in this room we had the answer to the crown, which is the answer I wanted because eh, it's wrong. The crown didn't have a chance to respond. The colonies wouldn't okay this plan because they felt like it tied them together and one colony could drag another colony into trouble and they didn't want that. So maybe the English were, were right. Maybe we were like herding cats or something. Uh, but this is the second time because of these wars that some colonies have got together. Remember we talked about the New England Confederation years before, which worked for a while and then fell apart. And now we're talking about this Albany Plan of Union and the people in the convention all agreed, but the people at home didn't. Nevertheless, it's a step towards intercolony communication and colonies recognizing some of them that their fate was tied in with the fate of the other colonies. It's just a step in that direction. No one in this thing said anything about independence or anything of that nature. Uh, there's a map that tells you everything that happened after this. Probably the first step, the British are going to uh, try and retake some of the territory up along the Great Lakes, take it away from the French, and they're going to get whoops. In 1757, 1756, but eventually they're going to get a general that can do his job. Wasn't a particularly nice man, he was a fairly able general. They'd gone through about three other generals and they settled on Jeffrey Amherst. I'll show you his name in a minute. And in 1758, one of his forces is going to go after a fort on the, on the Lake Champlain, which is kind of a route up into Canada. And they're going to strike the French up there the first time they get whooped. But eventually, they're going to move troops so that Amherst takes one force, moves them to Halifax, Nova Scotia. Remember, that used to be Acadia before the, before the British had it. They're going to go capture the French fort at Louisbourg, which they gave back to the French after the last war. One part of the British force under a young brigadier general named Wolfe is going to go up the St. Lawrence River all the way to Quebec. They'll get there in September 1759. Another force is going to go all the way up to Fort Frontenac, start driving the French back, and come down the St. Lawrence River from the other direction. That will be under the direct control of General Amherst. And eventually, long story short, General Wolfe is going to take Quebec. It's a, it's a very interesting battle because they had to scale up cliffs to get to this fort. And then somehow or other they persuaded the French that they needed to come out of their fort and fight on the plains of Abraham, with the result that both General Wolfe and General Montcalm, who was the overall commander of military French military forces there, both of them are going to be killed in this battle on the Plains of Abraham. But the British are going to defeat the French. And then they're going to start moving in the direction of Montreal. And in September of 1760, about a year later, they're going to capture Montreal. And basically, that's the end of all French resistance. The French don't have any more military forces they can field. One thing they couldn't turn off, whether they wanted to or not, was the Indians. Once they turned their on switch on, there was no stop switch. And the Indians are keep on doing things, but they won't be in an organized manner. Uh, over in Europe, they're negotiating the end of this war because it concerns all these other places in the world. Uh, 
And it won't be until 1763 that they finally come up with the Treaty of Paris, which is an interesting treaty. The greatest importance of it is the French agree to leave North America as a political and military force. Certainly their settlers are still going to be there, but they're now under British control. The British have control of all the major cities. And the British will go out into the hinterlands and take all the French outposts out there, one at a time. Unfortunately, they figured now that we've won, we're cock of the lock, nobody's going to get in our way. And they get a nasty, nasty surprise. You have to think about the way, this the way the British general would think. He's loading his soldiers back up to send them home so that mommy and daddy will stop screaming about where's my son and that sort of thing. And the chancellor of the exchequer will stop screaming about you're spending too much money. When the chief of a group of Indians or a family of Indians called the Ottawa, and the Indians are very, very unhappy because the great white father that promised them all these wonderful things is getting on ships and leaving. He's going to take it out on what was a French outpost and now is a British outpost, and he's going to wipe them out. There's Montcalm and Wolf. Those are some of the other things that happen. We'll go back and talk about that. By the way, right at the end of this, General Amherst is going to get fired, and I'll tell you why he got fired. And General Gage, Thomas Gage, will take over, and we'll talk about them too. But let's talk about kind of the next step, and I'm going to switch slides now. And I'm going to go over to a set Which one should I do? Let's take a look at I want to use one that you've got. I'm going to do one. I don't think you've got this set. It's the tail end of the of the other one. It's a short one called the French and Indian War, but I want you to see some points at the conclusion of this war. After the Seven Years War is over, we get this fellow by the name of Pontiac. Yeah, there's a car named after him. And he's going to attack a British outpost up along the Great Lakes, wipe them out. Now we call it Pontiac's War or Pontiac's Rebellion. He was not leading all the Indians, but when one Indian tribe sees another Indian tribe has just wiped out a British outpost, they're thinking, oh, maybe we can do that too. And the next thing you know, in 1763, when the British think this war is all over, they're going to start wiping out British outposts all along the frontier. And so General Amherst is going to have to, you know, say some bad words, pull his troops back out. Seven entire regiments of British soldiers are going to have to march back into the Great Lakes region to settle the problem with the Indians. Amherst wasn't really good at taking advice. There was a fellow by the name of Sir William Johnson who was the Indian agent for the British Crown out there, who'd done a good job in the French and Indian War. For a while he'd been in charge before Amherst took over. They weren't friends. Amherst does do something that's kind of neat if I've got the, do I, have the I don't have the proof on this one. One of Amherst's subordinates, one of his generals that are under him, or a colonel, comes up with a brilliant idea. I know how to handle the Indians. I know how to get rid of the Indians. I'm going to switch slides in a second because I don't have enough here. And what he suggests is there's a village that's been overcome by smallpox. So why don't we move into that village? We'll collect all the blankets in that village, hold them up, and give them to some of our Indian friends. Germ warfare is what we're talking about, and it worked. It wiped out at least one village. This is not a made-up story, because in the next set of slides I'm going to show you, there's actually the letters between Amherst and this young officer, where Amherst approves this. Now Amherst is called back to England, and he figures he's going back to get a medal for settling all the problems, and settling his part of the French and Indian War and all that. And what happens when he gets back there is they fire him. And Thomas Gage was temporarily in charge while Amherst was gone. Now he's going to become the official commander-in-chief of all British forces in North America. 
and eventually we'll even have another job. We'll talk about that when we get there. Let me put up these other slides. I think you have them already in, in Unit 4, in Unit 4 lectures. It's the American Revolution prelude, and it's got the word ultra on it because it's made for another system. And the first slide's kind of interesting. Once again, it's not something you need to write down, but you should know, know it. And that is all the other places that the British were involved in fighting in the war. So it was a complicated thing. It wasn't just the Americans against the French and Indians. There's Sir William Johnson again, super, British Superintendent of Indian Affairs. And for a while, he was in charge of everything before Amherst got appointed. There's Jeffrey Amherst. He approved his subordinates' plan to infect Indians with smallpox. His harsh treatment of the Indians was blamed by some in Britain for having caused Pontiac's Rebellion. And so he's going to get fired in October of 1763. Of course, William Johnson, who hated his guts, was writing Nancy Grahams back to England about him, which may have had something to do with that. But there was evidence. So Amherst is out. Gage is in. I have the note down here, John Peter Zinger. While all these things are going on, otherwise there's still life going on in the colonies. And one person becomes very important, even to you and me to this day, because he sets a court precedent. You see, in the old days, you could be convicted of slander and put in jail if you said bad things about the government. Even if they were true. And John Peter Zinger went to trial and they argued his case and they established the precedent the truth is the perfect defense against a charge of slander. In other words, if you're telling the truth, it's not slander. We still follow that precedent to this day with some small, small exceptions. So thank you, John Peter Zinger. Uh, Gage is going to end that conflict with the Indians by negotiation. They're going to sign a treaty called the Treaty of Fort Niagara, and basically it's all over. But there's still some dirty linen to clean up. There's still some people fighting that war in their minds, especially hatred of the Indians, blaming pretty much all Indians for what the French, French allies did. One group are the Paxton boys. You need to know about the Paxton boys. These things happen. The things that need to be punished. <coughs> That's God punishing me for getting on my high horse again. Uh, but I'm still on my high horse. I'm up on my uh, platform now preaching. Scots-Irish veterans of Paxton's Rangers who've been fighting the Indians that were allied with the French all through the French and Indian War decide on their own. They're from Pennsylvania. Remember how tolerant the Pennsylvanians were up to this point? They decide that they're going to get rid of all the Indians in Pennsylvania. We don't need Indians there. And so heroically, and I'm using that word sarcastically, heroically they turn on a village of Conestoga Indians and brutally attack them. They were peaceful Indians. They lived in houses. They were conforming to the lifestyle of the other settlers there. They brutally attacked them, did a lot of damage. Finally, authorities woke up went to rescue the Indians. They put them in, actually put them in the jail, not, not for a crime, but to protect them until they settled the Paxton boys. The Paxton boys broke into the jail and finished the job by hand, brutally, men, women, and children, it didn't matter. There's a description, I'm not gonna read it to you. You can read it, it's pretty gross, it's pretty gruesome. Eyewitness account of this. What I'm trying to say is, you know, we have those kind of incidents throughout our history and almost every country does one way or another. It's really sad. Some American results of this French and Indian War and all of them added together, really. Independent development of American colonies. They're doing it on their own. Agitation of the Native Americans by both the British and the French, causing them to become the enemies of the colonies. 
Now, if you were an Indian and you had to take sides between the British or the colonists, who would you take sides with? Think about this logically. I'm not talking about how powerful they are. Who would you take sides with? Anybody. This is a thinking thing. This is not a sit and listen class. Who would you take sides with if you were an Indian and you were confronted with having to make a choice, support the colonists or support the British? Who would you support? Come on, somebody. Somebody take a stab at it. British. British. The British. Can you give me a reason for it other than the fact that they're pretty powerful? Probably not even thinking those terms. You're thinking about war and fighting and all that. The thing about the British was the Indians reasoned they're going to leave. But the colonists are going to continue to be a problem for us forever. So they tended to support the, colonists, the, the British. Another problem that's going to affect the Americans is the massive debts incurred by France and Great Britain. Even though France has disappeared from North America, it's still going to be a problem. And the British are going to try and figure out ways to get their money back. Guess who they're going to try and squeeze it out of? And of course, you had these mutual resist, uh, resentments, like when the British came down and drafted a bunch of colonists to go fight down in Cartagena and places like that. The balance is upset because the French are gone. And you have these two attempts, one back in the 1600s, the New England Confederation, and then one later, the Albany Convention, in which some colonies, not all of them, but some colonies tried to get together and form a group. Things like that could be habit forming, as we will see. Okay, here we go, back to the, back to the slides. According to Mr. Hunt and a few thousand other historians, maybe more than that, the real beginning of the American Revolution started way before some of these events we've just talked about. There was something called the Great Awakening. Bad things happen in the world. A lot of people look towards their religion to wonder why. And one thing that people in the Church of England, people in all the other churches, the Congregationalists, whoever it was, realized was our religion is not re reaching the average people. Our religion doesn't seem to be relevant to the man on the street. We have to get through to them not just stand up in front of the pulpit and, and read what the laws of the church are and read a, a selection and then say, let us pray and then go home. We have to get through. So you're going to start seeing an appeal, even in the Church of England, by some ministers to reach the emotions, to wake those people out in the congregation up. It's going to happen in the Church of England. It's going to happen in the different congregational churches up in New England. It's going to happen all over. And it has several significances. One of the biggest names in the Great Awakening <coughs> was a Congregationalist Protestant from Massachusetts named Jonathan Edwards. And Jonathan Edwards had a way of waking up his parishioners. I don't know if any of you have ever seen the movie with starring Haley Mills, who's about my age now. She was my heartthrob when I was a kid. Cute girl. Pollyanna was the name of the movie. And she was a little girl that just saw the good things and everything. But the preacher in the little town that she lived in was a nice guy. And his, when he read his sermons, the people tended to sleep through them and then go home. And the lady that was providing his salary said, you've got to do something. You've got to reach them. And so he did. And it was kind of like this. He walks into church one day, and it's the same crowd. And, you know, the little kids are playing, and, and young people are looking at each other and not at the minister and all that sort of thing. And he leans over there, and he stares over the pulpit very quietly. He looks at him and says, "Death will come unexpectedly. Everybody's going like that. Everybody's freaking out. People wake up. And a lot of these preachers did that. They used this really 
really almost violent approach. And they said, if you don't reform now, you're going to where it's hot. You will burn in all eternity, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, Jonathan Edwards had wrote a really, really famous sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. That's kind of the, the notion that he used. They called these people that were trying to reach the people by good speaking and delivery, they called them the new lights. And the people who were doing it the old-fashioned way, they called the old lights. There was even one in the Church of England who was kind of doing this. One of the things, these people became so popular that their congregations, the people that came to hear them, couldn't fit in the church. And they started doing it outside. Even, even in the Church of England. One fellow from the Church of England was a guy named George Whitfield. Pronounced, spelled Whitefield. Educated in Oxford. He was a good speaker and some people down in Georgia invited him to come over and visit. So he did. He preached in the open air in England. He did it in America. He was one of the very first Anglican preachers to preach to slaves as well as the other people. In 1740, he starts an American tour all the way from south all the way up to New England. He's the closest thing he had back then to a rock star. People came from miles to hear him preach. Just imagine this. No loudspeakers, no amplification, no nothing. People had to crowd in to hear what he said. Up in Pennsylvania, up in Philadelphia, Benjamin Franklin, who was a deist, he believed in God. He believed God formed the world, and then God took a hike and left the world to take care of itself. That's what Diaz believed. I'm oversimplifying, but that's basically what they believe. And yet, even Benjamin Franklin went to hear George Whitfield deliver a sermon. This guy's good. I think I've got to go listen to it. It didn't matter whether he believed what he said or not. This is going to go all through the colonies. Why do I think it's the first step in the American Revolution? Because they're breaking away from the old ways in the church. And the church was highly influential. Doesn't matter if you were Church of England or any of the others. When they started doing this, this revival sort of preaching, it changed the, the, the nature of how people worship. Breaking away from the old. And you notice the, the new lights and the old lights. So what we're seeing is we're seeing a splitting apart from older tradition. And I think this, and I, a lot of other people think, this was kind of in the minds and hearts of colonists the ones that carried it all. So they're starting to feel we're turning over a new leaf. We're not England. Let's talk about the names and faces really quickly. Uh, George II is now on the throne. Thank you. Come on, George. Get on the screen. There you are. George II is now on the throne. We've got to give him some credit. Remember, he was in King George's War. That's who it was named after. He's the last monarch to get on a horse and go out there and fight with the troops. <clears throat> he didn't get along with his son. His son's name was Frederick, and they didn't talk to each other. So Frederick's never going to make it to the throne, not because his father does him in or anything, but he dies before the old man dies. So the grandson will be George III. He won't be there yet. <clears throat> Watch this list. Henry Pelham, Prime Minister of Great Britain, Duke of Newcastle, Pelham Hollis was his name. He's the Duke of Newcastle. William Pitt, or William Pitt is another Prime Minister. All these guys are Prime Ministers of England. One after the other, they get fired. John Stewart, George Greenville, we'll talk about him in a minute. Then we're going to talk about this. What's going on? Nobody's doing well about the problems in America. And so one after the other, they're going to get fired. Okay. The war's over. Pontiac's Rebellion is more or less calmed down. It won't totally go away, but it's calmed down. <coughs> the British decide, we know how to settle the problem with the Indians. And they draw a line. It's kind of like that doom de Versailles thing that the Pope drew in the world. This one goes down the Appalachian Mountain chain, which goes almost from the north side of the U.S. all the way to the southern end. 
They draw a line down there. They call it the Proclamation Line of 1763. And their solution is colonists stay to the east of this line. Indians can have everything to the west of this line. If you think that most of the people risked moving to the Americas and all that, basically for one thing, for opportunity, and opportunity is spelled with a four-letter word, land. And then you suddenly tell them, you can't go out and get any more land. That's not going to go over really big. The other problem the English had was they were having a problem collecting customs taxes. And the reason they were having a problem is, let's say you cat, catch John Smith smuggling or not paying his taxes, so you bring him to trial, probably in Boston where his ship was stationed. The prosecutor is an English prosecutor. The judge is probably an American, and the jury is probably all American too. What do you think your chances of convicting that American smuggler are? Not very good. And they got frustrated. And they changed. They said, OK, we'll fix that. From now on, we'll have the trials in an admiralty court. Admiralty meaning the naval court. We'll do it on ships. We won't have a jury. We'll have something like a court martial, where three naval officers will be judge and jury. Sometimes they even had it up in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And if you lived in Boston, that was a long way to bring supporting witnesses with you. And believe it or not, they started getting more convictions. Colonists did not like that. And they're going to argue against it. In fact, one, one article in our Bill of Rights actually refers directly to that. Admiralty courts. Lots of cases. The other thing was a problem they had with a nasty little thing that was long in British law called warrants. Search warrants. <clears throat> Here's, paint this picture. I'm a British customs collector and I've got some of my minions working with me. And I find out that John Hancock has a cargo of Madeira wine that he smuggled into Boston. So I get my little minions and we go charging over to the ship that's docked there. And we say, <clears throat> we're going to inspect this ship for contraband. And the captain says, but sir, may I see your warrants, please? <laughs> So we go running back to the court, find a friendly judge, which is a little bit difficult too. We get a warrant, we go charging back to the ship, and guess what? The ship's empty. Where did it all go? Somebody whispers in his ear, it's in his warehouse. Now we charge over to the warehouse. Bang, 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 open up, we're looking for contraband. Where's your warrant? Ah! Now we have to go back and get another warrant. That just wasn't working. There was a custom, however, and it wasn't set up for this reason, called writs of assistance. A writ of assistance was a letter given by the country's highest authority, usually the king, and basically it said that if you were pursuing a legal event, hot pursuit or whatever, that you can require local authorities to help you. Not only that, but you can search as you wish. Signed by His Majesty the King. And it lasted, it lasted until the guy that issued the writ died. Or until he was replaced. Not only, so what you basically have is a forever search warrant. And the other part of it is, it's like a John Doe search warrant. What do I mean by John Doe search warrant? I mean a search warrant that has a big blank where it says who you're going to search. And you just fill out whoever you want in there. And it's perpetual. You can use it forever once you get one of these writs. And the colonists really didn't like that. Because now you could run over to John Hancock's warehouse and check it whenever you wanted. It was fought in court. There are a lot of court cases about it. We don't have time to talk about them. But Admiralty Courts, writs of assistance, that proclamation line of 1763, Colonists are not happy. Now, in a lot of cases, this is probably only the wealthy colonists, because the other people didn't really pay attention to it. Men on the streets, busy scratching the ground to make a living. 
but some people were aware of what was going going on and unhappy. There's a lot of cases. Okay, in comes George Grenville, new prime minister. There he is, good old George. He's going to shoot himself right through the foot. First of all, he's going to reduce the tax on sugar. He's going to pass a new Revenue Act called the Revenue Act of 1764. And the major importers and big businessmen were furious. Why would the big businessmen be furious about an act that reduced the tax? Because, you see, they hadn't been paying the tax anyway. And now the British Navy has nothing better to do, and they're going to come over and enforce the tax. So now you're actually going to have to pay money. What made it even worse, at the same time, they passed a currency act. And the currency act says, you have to pay your taxes in hard money. That means either gold or silver, or something that's backed by gold or silver. You can't just do one of these promissory notes, you can't do a local note. And all banks were issuing their own notes, and some big businesses issued notes. They wouldn't take those anymore. Man on the street doesn't even know about this. The big businessmen knew about it. Now guys like John Hancock had cash. They weren't broke. He was one of the wealthiest men in the whole world at one point. Why was he angry about having to pay in cash? The reason he was angry about having to pay in cash was that he needed that cash money for something else. Okay, in general terms, not specifics, but in general terms, what do you always need cash for? What kind of transaction do you always need cash for? Anybody. Come on, guys, wake up. We're almost done. Wake up, wake up. What do you need cash for? I know you're all innocent people, so you probably wouldn't be thinking about this. You don't need cash for food. You can trade for food. What do you need cash for? Who won't... Who won't take anything but cash? I, w I won't ask for examples because sometimes people come up with ones that we don't want to talk about in class. But Your conference making, is scheduled to end in two minutes. The point I'm making is illegal transactions are the only ones where people demand cash because they want no record of it. Right? Well, that was what the big money guys were doing because they were sneaking down to the Caribbean and buying sugar and stuff like that which was totally illegal and this is going to put a crimp in their style does the man on the street care? no the man on the street doesn't care it may announce that the conference is over but if the screen doesn't go blank hang in there guys Prime Minister Grinville now proceeds to shoot himself to the foot because he's still not making enough money. And in 1765, he announces that... that now, these are all indirect taxes. And what I mean by indirect... I'll put it up in a minute. What a I, question. Question. And question. Anybody got a question? Somebody waving their hand? No? Okay. Indirect tax means it's, it's just hitting the importers. The man on the street's not paying it. He doesn't know anything about it. He doesn't care, right? He just buys his stuff from the retailer. But the guys that are importing, these things really affect them. That's an indirect tax. A direct tax is one that involves everybody. And what George Grinville is going to do right now, which is a big mistake, is he's going to set up a direct tax. And by doing that, he's going to drag everybody else into this argument that didn't really care about it. It's called the Stamp Act of 1765. There's big stars next to it because that's one of the turning points that started turning us towards thoughts of revolution or thoughts of resistance. They shut me off. No, I'm still there. Okay, I didn't, I thought I lost you guys for a minute. All right.
Stamp Act. Let's talk about some of the things. The Stamp Act was not about postage stamps. If anybody says, takes that, picks that answer in the exam, lightning will strike. And you'll be turned into a crispy critter. Uh, you know what a crispy critter is? That's something that's burned into ashes. Uh, the Stamp Act was on printed documents, ranging from newspapers to different deeds, deeds, marriage certificates, death certificates, bills of sale, even playing cards. And you had to use paper on which tax had been paid to execute any of those documents. And this is going to bring the man on the street onto the street, for sure. Because it's going to affect almost everybody. In fact, it affects, in particular, a few kinds of people you don't want to take off. For example, who's responsible for doing wills and court cases and things like that that would be recorded on paper? What kind of people? I can't hear. Hello, Senator, I can't hear you. Somebody tried to answer. I'll answer it for you. Lawyers, right? They're mad about this. Who's responsible back then for marriage certificates, baptismal certificates, death certificates sometimes? Yeah, your local preacher. Who's responsible most of the time for death certificates, certificates of live birth and all that before the state took it over? Who delivered the babies? The doctor or midwife. Who's responsible for printing the newspaper? Journalist. Stop and think about that. So you've ticked off lawyers, doctors, preachers, and journalists. If there's four kinds of people that you don't want to upset, that's them. Because they have influence. They have a voice. And all these people are going to be outraged. Down in Virginia, the House of Burgess is, is going to meet, and a fiery orator, a young fellow by the name of Patrick Henry, is going to spout fire about this. You're violating our rights as Englishmen. And the Virginia Assembly will pass resolutions and send a nasty gram over to England. And then up in Massachusetts, a letter is going to go out telling all the colonies they can get hold of, let's meet, and they eventually meet in New York. There, by the way, you can't see it. There is a kind of romanticized picture, if it'll come up, of Patrick Henry giving his fiery speech. There's the Virginia Resolve. Are those guys gone, they're still there. There's a fellow named James Otis. He did a lot of the pamphlets about this. He won't live all the way through the American Revolution, but he's the leader of the Stamp Act Congress. What are they going to do in the Stamp Act Congress? They're going to pass a Declaration of Rights and Grievances. Those are the states that participated. They're going to send that over to England. The Crown's not impressed. But they are impressed when people come into the streets and start throwing rocks through the governor's window and start chasing tax people Your around. conference is now over. Now over. Goodbye. Goodbye. One minute remaining, it says. It keeps giving me different. Now it's gone. So we'll talk. We'll start out finishing off the Stamp Act, and we're going to get into the American Revolution next time. We need to finish the American Revolution by Wednesday next week because our exams on Friday next week. Is that in person or online? In person. Does everybody have a in this room have a uh, laptop? Okay, bring your laptop in next class so we can try them out and make sure they're working in this room because we'll take the exam on the laptop. Okay? Don't forget. Have a nice day, guys.